my gosh, dude. What else do the Illyrians have going on? That's like their whole thing. Hello, I'm Madeline Orgis Maddie, and I have a lot on my mind lately. So we are going to focus on two of perhaps the least important things, which are cross-stitching and A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. So first of all, the cross-stitch. I need to finish a birthday gift for a friend, and it is uh, going to say, no one acknowledge my good joke in the group chat. Right now it just says good joke in the group chat. And then that little guy is going to be a crab, as I'm sure you can tell by his one eye and strange little black tendrils. Those will eventually be legs. Why did I do it this way? <laughs> I haven't even been going about it symmetrically. Okay, this will be fun. So I have my pattern open here and we'll try to make sense of it while talking at the same time. Talking about what A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. That's why I really need you here to just kind of help me sort through my thoughts on this series. And I've mentioned the series on my channel in the past it's been so long since I read it, but for some reason, it's just been on my mind again. I find myself just returning to these same questions over and over. I'm gonna try not to make it a rant. I'm gonna try to keep it to questions, but who knows? I wanna emphasize here, I am not an Akotar hater. I probably qualify as a fan because I've read all the books. I plan to read the next book in the series, and I've even dipped a little toe into the greater fandom, the YouTubes, the Reddits. I like eavesdropping on the conversation at large. That being said, it's been over a year since I read any of these books, and I am by no means an expert, so some of my questions are probably pretty dumb. Just warning you ahead of time that there might be, like, glaring answers that I just totally have forgotten because time has passed. I have done no work to find the answers on my own. Isn't that fun? But if you know any answers to my stupid questions, please put those answers in the comments. I want to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. Help me learn. Where am I even at here? Okay. And then we, okay, that's the bottom. Okay, I can do this. Wait, where am I? So first question is sort of an obvious one. How do you pronounce that guy's name? Is it Rysand? Rizand? I say Rysand, like what you would use as a verb if you were talking about how to put more sand on something that has already had sand put on it. Like we need to go Resand the sand volleyball pit. That's how I say it. Is that? I've heard it every single way. Feel free to correct me, but we're gonna go with resand, as in the verb. Now to move on to other names in his same family. Why don't any of resand's family members get to have names? I get that they're deceased, which is a bummer, but why don't they get names? It makes sense for him to refer to them as like my mother, my sister, when he's talking about them. That makes some sense to me, but like, at a certain point, they should have names. His mom and his sister get mentioned fairly frequently. It reminds me of, so I have several sisters, which means that my little brother also has several sisters. And his little friends, understandably, when they were small children, could not keep our names straight. So they just called us all Gogo sister. My brother's name is not Gogo. That's a nickname, but I don't need to put his government name on the internet. Anyway, so his little friends would just be like, Go go sister, can we make pizza rolls? So when I hear like Cassian and Azriel constantly like Rhysand's mom, Rhysand's sister, it just reminds me of that. Like, do you not remember their names? His mom like raised you. Same goes for Lucian's mom, the lady of the autumn court who is alive and who speaks. But why doesn't she get a name? She's just the lady of the autumn court. And Moore's mom, who I don't know if she talks, I don't remember, but Moore's dad gets a name. Why doesn't Moore's mom get a name? Moms are people too. And honestly, at this point, it's probably too late for some of them to get names, right? Like if in book five or is it six now? I don't know. Someone's suddenly like, oh yeah, the lady of the autumn court. You mean Carla? That woman that we frequently discuss who is only ever referred to by her title. And there are probably people who think that some of this has to do with the like greater conspiracy theory or whatever of all the Sarah J Mass books being interconnected. Like maybe the names would be a giveaway that some of these things are connected, but I suspect that it's just that she doesn't think that the readers can keep all the names straight. And to that I say, maybe, but you can also put a roster in the back of the book. And if someone forgets who Carla is, they can flip on back and go, oh, she was Lady of the Autumn Court, duh. So I guess I said I wanted to keep this to questions. So I guess my question is, why don't moms get to have names? So Lucian's parents are alive, which is great, kind of. 
am I understanding the whole like high fairy thing or like high fae thing correctly where his parents would still look like they're in their 20s like no matter how old you get if you're a high fae you still look like you're young and if so is that weird where your dad looks like he could be your brother I don't know that just came to my mind and I honestly wonder if the tv series will do that differently just because they don't want to confuse people I could see that being a thing this is a boring question but I'm gonna ask it anyway what is up with the financial landscape of the fairy courts? What kind of feudal system are we working with here? Because Tamlin in the spring court was shown as being an asshole about taxes or tribute or whatever he was having the fairies in the spring court do to like fund him as the government. But I don't think we ever see Resan talking about like taxes or tribute or anything like that. And I'm just wondering, where is he getting his seemingly unlimited money from if like the fairies aren't paying taxes? Maybe like his ancestors had taxes and then he was like, I've got enough. No more taxes. I don't know. Like I said, this one's boring, but as long as I'm throwing out some questions, might as well throw out all the questions. But honestly, Reese's whole approach to government just confuses me. I'm just very confused by how he is choosing to run the area that he's in charge of. For example, are the people in the Court of Nightmares allowed to leave? Are they down there by choice? This is one of those things that's probably addressed somewhere in the book and I just don't remember. But it almost feels like he just took all the shitty people from his part of the like fairy realm and just put them somewhere and was like, figure yourselves out. I can't do hand gestures and so at the same time. Like, what are they doing down there? And then Reese comes and goes, I have to play the part of the ruthless high lord when I'm at the Court of Nightmares. But, like, dude, is that working? How's that working out for you? Is that making a difference? Isolating the shitty people and just showing up and being an asshole doesn't seem to be having any sort of impactful change on the culture. Also, I'm so confused about what about that area is so bad? Are they just mean? Maybe if you let them see the sun sometimes, or if they got some different friends, they would clean up their act a little bit. I don't know, I'm not in charge. And then meanwhile, you have Valeris, which is a city full of artists and farmers markets and raw denim outlets, and no one is allowed to know about it. Because if the people from the Court of Nightmares show up, they could ruin it. And I just think it's maybe inadvisable to have a closed border policy between cities in your own country because one is your favorite and one you hate. Also, was it really truly necessary for Rhysand to have Feyre sit on his lap half naked in the Court of Nightmares to cause a diversion so they could go find whatever item they were there to look for? Couldn't he have just been like, hey, here, book us a conference room and order out for lunch. I want a full report on the infrastructure improvements that you have planned. Like you're in charge of the country. You're in charge of this whole thing. Can you not like just get it in hand? That's all I'm asking. For being the most powerful High Lord in history, it just doesn't seem like Reese really has his country in hand. When they have the war, when they have the war, he and his buddies are like, we're gonna have to convince Kier to have his army fight with us in the war, or like, we really need to uh, convince the Illyrians to fight with us. They're your army, dog. They're yours. Why, they're, strong arm them. I don't know. Ugh. And I know that part of it is probably that he was away because he was under the mountain, so maybe he needs to build up some more trust with some of these groups and stuff, and I get that. But at the same time, like, if you're in war, maybe you have to skip the, skip some steps. Especially because with the Illyrians specifically, when they're talking about we need to convince the Illyrians to fight with us in this war, oh my gosh, dude, what else do the Illyrians have going on? That's like their whole thing. So... He, yeah, um, I was back into rant territory a little bit, but that's a question is why, what else do the Illyrians have going on except for preparing for war? Their whole thing is training. So here's some more questions. What is the economy of the Illyrian mountains when so much of their time and energy is based on training for fights and war? How is their society operating when, okay, let's say 40% because it's mostly men, right? who are doing the training, let's say 40% of their population is constantly just training to become great warriors. That's not adding any goods or services into their economy. It's actually just a drain on those things. So that leaves 
maybe a little over half depending of the population to deal with the goods and services part of the economy and to help fund and take care of the people who are basically just focused on getting really swole and really good at fighting. So why would they ever not want to fight with you in the war? I guess if they just don't like you that much, but also holy crap, like how can you justify spending that much time on that? If there's not really anybody to fight, I don't remember in the books if like there's infighting between different groups of Illyrians or something, but it's so much training for what? For why? And why did we have to make the bat wings sexy? Why did they have to be sensitive in a sexual way? Can't they just be like, I don't know, ticklish or something? And I don't even like thinking about it because they're so exposed. To have gigantic bat wings on your back, you can't see. What's going on back there? So uncool. I would hate that. I'm ticklish on the back of my thighs. And in crowds, I'm constantly doing a little 360 spin like a top just to make sure that nobody's getting too close to the back of my thighs because they're ticklish. So imagine having enormous bat wings attached to your back that someone can just come up and eat her, eat her. Horrible. No wonder they all feel so defensive all the time. They've got the most vulnerable part of their anatomy taking up a ton of space somewhere where they can't see or do anything about anybody who goes after it. Like, ugh. Also, I know I'm not the first person to bring this up, but why in this world do they know about lactic acid? They don't know about C-sections. Like, I distinctly remember Cassian mentions lactic acid when they're talking about training and stuff. And I was like, eh, what? I just imagine the like fairy scientists or healers going, all right, we've got women and infants dying in childbirth, but we also have the lads getting sore muscles. So which one of these should take priority? Yes, we know that they should stretch to relieve soreness, but we need to know what causes it. It needs to have a name. So give the women a belt to bite down on because our soldiers need us. We need to discover lactic acid for because reasons. I guess I shouldn't even talk because maybe in real life, I didn't look it up. Maybe in real life we discovered and dealt with lactic acid before C-sections too. I don't know. He has eyes and part of a claw. We're making progress. But if they're focusing that much time and attention on athletic performance and research into that, why can't Cassian hold a plank for longer than five minutes? He says he can hold a plank for five minutes and Nesta's all impressed and that number is burned into my brain forever because I did, I did look it up. The human world record is over nine hours to hold a plank. And you're telling me that the greatest general in this whole magical realm can hold a plank for five minutes and I'm supposed to be impressed? Don't think so. Even if the bat wings add extra weight, you can do better than that. Ridiculous. Don't worry, I'll pick on Azrael too. Where are people getting a personality for Asriel other than quiet, simpy knife man? I'm gonna read the next book in the series, if only because I wanna know if that is actually his personal, like what does he have going on? People love that scene where they're all meeting and Tamlin shows up and like calls Feyre a slut or something. And then Asriel just goes like dead behind the eyes, ruthlessly beating the shit out of him. And no one can stop him except for Favor goes over and is like, Azrael, stop. You can come hold my purse instead. And then Azrael says something to Tamlin and he's like, don't talk about my high lady like that. And people are obsessed with that scene and they like get TikTok thirst trap boys to repeat that line. And I hate it. If I'm a high lady with all these crazy powers and someone says something to me that makes me feel as though their ass needs to be kicked, I will kick that ass myself. Azriel's response just felt kind of weird and extreme to me. Maybe that's just a me thing. Moving on to other things that are extreme. There are 10,000 steps up to the House of the Wind. This has been approved by the American Heart Association. I'm sure that we've all had thoughts and complaints and discussion about why the heck Nesta had such a hard time going down those steps, but I'll echo them here because I feel like it. Because we all know going upstairs is so much harder than going downstairs. 
I guess good job to her for knowing her body enough to know when she had just enough energy to turn around and go back up the stairs when she had tried to go down. Also, I'm pretty sure that that was one of the rules, like one of the stipulations with the house was that it couldn't do any, like it couldn't get rid of the stairs or like turn the stairs into a slide for her or anything, which I get. But like, Nesta, babes, ask the house for a laundry basket, sit in the laundry basket, Moses yourself down the steps. You might get banged up a little bit, but we used to do that as kids and didn't break any bones and we're not immortal. We're just little human children. So it's an option. Could also just grab the blanket from your bed, sit on it at the top of the stairs, pull the middle up between your legs and just scoot. You'll hurt your bony little butt, but you'll make it down eventually. You gotta want it. Speaking of the steps in general with the whole house of the wind, do people who want to go there, if they can't winnow, do they have to go up the steps every time? Like if Reese has office hours up there or like with the Starfall party, did everybody have to walk up 10,000 steps just to like be there? Cause that's kind of a dick move. Like, yeah, you can come to the party, but wear shoes that you can hike in. Okay, my last question is regarding the quote that gets put on all of the Aquatar merchandise and is the thing that people like talk about and whatever from this series and it's, to the stars who listen and the dreams that are answered. What does that mean? What does it mean? I'm no stranger to word salad. I work in marketing and advertising and I have tossed the occasional word salad in my day. And sometimes it doesn't matter what it means. It just matters if the client thinks it sounds good. But this particular phrase has basically the lettuce and spinach of word salad, which are stars and dreams. There are some words like stars and dreams and scars and like breath. You can throw those words into any sort of phrase and it is Pinterest optimized. It is good to go for tote bags and iPhone wallpapers and whatever else you wanna put it on. Sounds great. Doesn't really matter if it means anything. Maybe it does. And if you have this phrase like tattooed on your body and you're feeling some type of way about my feelings about it, I'm so sorry. And if it means something to you, that's great. What does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. To the stars who listen, okay, and the dreams that are answered. I get that the phrase somehow fits the aesthetic of the book. It would probably also help if I could remember what the context of the conversation was. I think it's a toast between Reese and Pharaoh where they talk about the stars listening and the dreams being answered, but taken away from that context especially, I'm like, what are you talking about? So anyway, here's to the crabs that listen and the group chats that are answered. Here's the progress we got on the project. Our crab now has two eyes and a mouth and also a claw that's not been colored in yet. And uh, I started in the center for the top line of text. So it says owl because it will eventually say no one acknowledged my good joke in the group chat. But instead it just says owl good joke in the group chat one clawed crab. I'll finish it up later, but thank you so much for keeping me company. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like it and comment and stuff, and I'd love to see you subscribe. But in the meantime, just have a great day, and I'll see you in another video that probably won't involve the textile and fabric arts, but we'll see. Never say never. Peace out. Have you tried, like, leadership?